<clears throat> Inshallah, everyone can hear me? Okay, just making sure. Thank you. Ufawidu amri ila Allah inna Allah basirun bil ibad ma sha Allah wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al ali al azim a'udhu billahi min ash shaitan lain ar rajim bismillahi ar rahman ar rahim alhamdulillahi alladhi la yablughu midhatahu al qailun wa la yuhsini ma hu al adun wa la yuwaddi haqqahu al mujtahidun alladhi la yudrikuhu bu'dul himam wa la yanalahu ghawsul fitan الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا عجل ممدود ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على النبي الأمي القرشي الهاشمي المكي المدني سيدنا ومولانا وطبيب قلوبنا والشفيع ظنوبنا وحبيب إلهنا أبي القاسم محمد <تصفيق> وعلى آله أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الميامين المظلومين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله الأعظم في الأرضين أرواحنا وأرواح العالمين لمقتمه فداء ثم أما بعد رب شهر لسدري ويسر لأمري وقت لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي سلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد Mumin and Muminat, Adam Allah, Ujurana, Ujura Kum, we are Alhamdulillah in these days of Arba'in, where we can be together no matter where the distance is. But inshallah, uh, we are all together as Mu'mineen, commemorating and remembering and grieving and mourning for Abu Abdullah al Hussein. This is an important pillar of our deen. This is an important pillar of our faith that we are, ab- we are able to be together, inshallah, inshallah. All those mu'minin who have gone for ziyarat to Arba'in, I'm sure you know of some, and I know a few, our family members and friends, they have made the biggest pilgrimage in the world, that 25 million or more people have gone for this pilgrimage and ziyarat of Abu Abdullah al Hussein to the holy city of Karbala and to visit the Aimma alayhum as who are buried in Iraq. Inshallah, we get the tawfiq. We are not there in person this year. But inshallah, we are there in spirit. So I just want to remind you of the importance of these days of Arba'in. Arba'in means 40. And it has been 40 days since uh, Ashura. So we remember Abu Abdullah Hussein in this way. That was taught to us by the Ahlul Bayt, especially by Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam. Risal salawat, please. I want to begin with a story to... Talk about some of the things that we see in the life of the Ahlul Bayt, especially in the life of uh, our eighth Imam Ali ibn Musa al Rida alayhi salam, whose shahadat and whose martyrdom is also commemorated during these days right next to our Ba'in. In the life of Imam al Rida, we see that he lived mostly in the city of Madinah al Munawwara. The beautiful city of Madinah is the city of. Rasulullah, it is a city of the Ahl al-Bayt. And Imam al-Rada alayhi salam loved the city of Medina a great deal. He loved it a lot. He lived there for most of his life, except the last two or three years of his life that he was taken to Khurasan. During his life, there were many people who were ruling through the Abbasid leadership. The Abbasids had come to power and the Banu Abbas, who were the cousins of the Ahlul Bayt, through Abbas, the uh, relative of the Prophet, they came to power and they ruled. But they were very harsh and they were very oppressive and they were very cruel to the Ahlul Bayt and to the family of Rasulullah because they knew who the Imams were from the Ahlul Bayt and they made sure that the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and the followers of the Imams were always under surveillance, always under control, their movements were controlled and that they were not able to go to the places that they wanted to go to all the time. During this time, there were two camps. One group was the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, including Imam al Rada and his father, Imam al Qadim, who was in prison for a long time. And there was, and their followers. So those groups of people who sat there 
and said, it is not correct for us to just sit there and take this oppression. We are going to do something about it. So there were some revolutions. There were some changes. There was Muhammad, one of the sons of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, who was there. He led a small revolution. There were other people who were revolting because they were not happy with Banu Abbas and the cruelty of Banu Abbas, who were the powers at that time. So Banu Abbas were fighting kind of a cold war with the imams of the Ahl al-Bayt. And sometimes it was also bloody. You see, brothers and sisters, oppression always creates opportunity. Remember that. Oppression can be a good thing for some people. Because when there is a dhulm, when there is jawr, when there is sitam, as we say in Urdu and Farsi, we see that there are some people who see that as an opportunity. We see that around us today. I don't have to mention to you, but there's always people making money off of the genocide and the conflict and that war that is going on in the world, especially against our Palestinian brothers and sisters. At that time, there were some people who said the Banu Abbas are hiring the Banu Abbas have power, the Banu Abbas have control, and excuse me, what we're going to do is we are going to work for the Banu Abbas. We are going to work for them. There's one guy I want to tell you his story. That this guy, his name was Isa, Isa ibn Yazid al-Jalludi. And this gentleman, Jalludi, was someone who was there for about eight or nine years, okay? He became, actually, actually around 10 years, and he became a very powerful general during the time of Imam al-Rida salam. What was his task? He was not from any great family. He was not from any great place. He only belonged to some of the people uh, that came from the countries who would take out, you know, advantage of the opportunity. And what did he do? Jaludi came and he said to the Banu Abbas, I can fight for you. I can do all the things you want me to do. So they said, okay, you can go and you can do some of the things when, uh, you know, we want to control the Ahl al-Bayt. We want to fight the Ahl al-Bayt. We want to have surveillance under the Ahl al-Bayt, especially uh, under uh, Amin and then Ma'moon and Nia. Yeah. And under Hassan ibn Sahal, these are the Banu Abbas leaders. Jaludi was sent to do many things. He was sent to kill and attack some of the people of the Ahl bayt He was sent to watch over them in Medina, in Mecca, in Basra, in Kufa, across the land. Wherever there was a need to suppress and oppress and to kill, Jaludi was sent. And he would show up. Think about this. Is a person who has power and money, and is taking advantage. He comes to the house of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salam. Risala salawat, please. He comes to the house of the blessed Imam, and what does he do? History tells us that when he comes to the house of the eighth Imam, the eighth Imam is living with his family, with his community, with his family members in Medina. And Jaludi comes and he says, he knocks on the door. Imam Rada alayhi salam, he answers the door. Imam Rada at this time is living in Medina. He's teaching in Medina. He's performing his duties as an Imam in Medina. He is worshipping Allah in the masjid of his grandfather Rasulullah. And he's doing his duties that are wajib on him as an Imam. Correct? Jaludi says, I have been commanded by the Khalifa to come and burn your house. I have been commanded to come and destroy your property. I have been commanded to come and take whatever you have. This is the duty that has been given to him by Banu Abbas. Astaghfirullah. The Imam is quiet because you know, and I know, and we know that this is not the first time that someone has come to burn the house of the Prophet's family. This is not the first time that the house of the Imam of the time has been attacked. This has happened before and it happened again. So 
Imam Rada is quiet and silent. Imam Rada says, why did you come here? Jalludi says, I have been command to attack you. Imam says, hold on a minute. Wait, I have children in the house. I have the ladies in the house. I have orphans in the house. I have my wor workers in the house. Is there something that you will take instead of burning this house? Jalludi was quiet. He said, okay, give me all your wealth. Give me all that you have. Imam Radha goes, okay. He goes inside. He collects all the, whatever wealth he had. It was not much. As you know, the Imam left, the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, they left a lot of things for us. But they did not leave wealth or money. They left knowledge. And they left their akhlaq. And they left their teachings. And they left their manhaj and their sunnah, their path and their way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they did not leave a lot of wealth. So, Imam Radha goes inside, he takes the wealth of this, whatever he had, and he brings the jewelry and he gives it to Jaludi. He says, here you go. Is this okay for you? Jaludi looks at it and says, okay, I will leave you alone now. My duty is done. I don't have to answer to anybody. So Jaludi was so powerful at that time that he used to travel across the Muslim lands wherever he wanted, Basra, Kufa, Makkah, Medina, Hijaz, Jerusalem, and he would attack, and whatever others he was given, he had to follow them, but he did not, was not required to follow them. So he did not follow the orders to destroy the house of Imam Radha. He took from Imam Radha, he stole from Imam Radha, and he went on his way. He was he could do that much. This is a person of power. It's a person of opportunity. It's a person of cleverness. Now, what happens is, Amin and Mamun are two brothers who fight for the Khilafah. And Mamun is the one that invites Imam al Radha, forces Imam al Radha, compels Imam al Radha to leave his blessed beloved Medina. And from Medina, Imam Ali ibn Musa is taken all the way to Khurasan, where he is buried in the holy city of Mashhad. It's very far, thousands of miles away. All the way across, he has to travel through Iraq and Iran and get to Mashhad, to Khurasan. The opposite end of the Islamic world where Imam al radha is taken. There Imam al radha is, is taken. And there he's given an opportunity, excuse me, there he's given an opportunity to be with Mamun. And Mamun is trying to make Imam al radha his Khalifa and his uh, successor because he knows that somehow he has to control the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to kill Imam al radha right away. He has his political ways of just trying to control the imams of the Ahlul Bayt and their followers. So here, one day, there is a discussion between those people who used to work before and what they used to do and what Mamun is doing. He's taking account. He's doing hisab. Right? A new person comes into power. They always try to take account and review whoever was before them. Now, this is an important point. Please pay attention. Jaludi is brought before the Khalifa Mamun. Jaludi comes, the same person. After 10 years of doing his wreaking havoc and killing people and looting and doing whatever he was doing, he comes. And he's standing in front of Mamun, sitting next to Imam al -Radha. Imam al -Radha is given a place of power by Al-Mamun. And there, Jaludi becomes afraid. The man of success, the man of opportunity, he becomes very afraid. He's standing there looking at Imam Radha. He recognizes Imam Radha. Who doesn't? And he knows what he did. So Mamun goes, what did you do? Where did you go? So Jaludi is telling him all the things that he did. Then Mamun says, what should be done with you? What should we do with you? Because, well, Mamun is tired of Jaludi. He wants to get rid of him somehow. Imam al radha quietly gets up and goes to the Khalifa. Imam al radha himself goes to the Khalifa, who is right there in the same room with Jaludi, and he whispers something in the ear of Al-Mamun. He whispers something in the ear of the Khalifa. He says something. Jaludi is watching this. 
And then Imam Brada comes back and sits down on his seat. Al Mamun listens to what Imam Brada told him in his ear. Al Mamun goes, Okay, what should be done with you, Jaludi? Al Jaludi, what should be done with you? Al Jaludi goes, Whatever you want to do, please do, but don't listen to what Ali ibn Musa told you. Don't listen to Imam Rada. This is Jaludi's words. Mamun goes, are you sure? Jaludi goes, yes. Don't listen to him. Whatever he told you, don't do that. Because I attacked his house in Medina. I took everything he had. Don't listen to him. Al-Mamun goes, I'm giving you the third chance. Third time. What is going to happen with you? Jaludi goes, please don't listen to this man. And Al-Mamun goes, okay. That's fine. Tomorrow morning, Jaludi, you will be executed. You will be killed. Jaludi goes, what? Al-Mamun goes, Imam Marada came and told me to spare your life, to let you go, to forgive you, to give you another chance in life so that you can learn. So that you can learn. But Jaludi, you chose not to. It was your choice. And three times you were asked and you said no. So because Imam Radha wanted me to spare you, I'm not going to spare you. You are going to be killed. And the next morning, Jaludi was killed. Brothers and sisters, <laughs> each act of the Imams, السلام, each of their movements is a lesson for us. Wallahi, they are full of wisdom. Jaludi was fortunate enough, I think. Jaludi was lucky enough, I think. Jaludi was blessed enough that after committing a life of sin, a life of oppression, a life of killing, a life of murder and genocide, he had the possibility of getting another chance. What would have happened if Al-Mamun would have listened to Imam Rada and spared Al-Jaludi? Jaludi would have known and become the disciple of the Imam. He would have become the follower of the imam. He would have become close to the imam. Maybe he had the opportunity. We don't know. We don't know. But he did not find any success. He did not find any chance to repent. He did not find any chance to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rishad Salwat, please. <laughs> this is important, my dear brothers and sisters. Imam al Radar recited a certain ayah from the Quran. What ayah did he recite? The Imam goes, "Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim." Qad aflah al-mu'minun. Qad aflah al-mu'minun. Al-ladina hum fi salatihim khawashiyoon. Wal-ladina hum anil laghwi mu'ridoon. Wal-ladina hum li zakati fa'iloon. Wal-ladina hum li furujihim hafidoon. Illa ala azwajihim aw ma malakat aymanuhum fa innahum ghayru malumin. Fama nibtaga wara adhalika fa ulaika humul aadoon. Wal-ladina hum li amanatihim wahdihim ra'oon. Wal-ladina hum ala salatihim yuhafidoon. Ala salawatihim yuhafidoon. Ula'ika humul warithun, alladina yarithun al firdausa, hum fiha khalidun. Surah number 23. Surah number 23. This beautiful surah, the Imam mentioned, beautiful, the first 11 verses of the surah. I will share with you the wisdom and the teaching of the Imam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah, certainly the mu'minun have become victorious. They have found victory. They have found success. They have found falah. You see, in English, we say success. We say success. He is successful. She is successful. That's all we say. But in Arabic, it's very complicated. <laughs> falah, aflaha means to reach the result of your efforts. Sometimes you try and you try and you don't get any result, right? That's not success but maybe you get something else in return. So that in English, that's called success. In Arabic, falah means, no, you try for something and you get that thing, that's falah. Fawz is something that means you reach victory in the face of hardship. Okay? We, take, we say this about the companions of Imam Hussain, as you recite in the Ziyarat of Warith, the Ziyarat of Ashura, faqad, 
if we work with you ya laytana kunna ma'akum fa nafuza ma'akum fawzan azima you know this and you should recite this if we were with you we would have become victorious or successful and nasr in a, is another type of victory in arabic so arabic is complicated but here what the imam is drawing our attention to is that the true victory is this victory the true path are these 11 verses, my dear brothers and sisters. I say this to myself, and I say this to you, because we live in a dunya, we live in a world where people like Jaludi are successful. People like Jaludi are looked up to. People like Jaludi are successful leaders and politicians all around the world. Who is safe today? Huh? Thousands of Palestinians have lost their life. They're not the only people who are oppressed, but they are one example. There are other people who are being uh, oppressed in the world, and there's no justice for them in Europe, in Africa, in our country, in, in Asia, in India, Australia, wherever. But what is our idea of success? Look at the people who are safe today. Look at the people who can do genocide and murder of thousands of innocent people and walk the world safely. They are successful. So Jalud, we are living in a world of Jaludis. Maybe in Imam Radha's time there was one, but now there are hundreds. Well, like there are hundreds of Jaludis now. And when there are hundreds of them walking, the quality of the believers, the weakness of the Muslims in the Quran is the same as the weakness we see today. Is that when they see rich people, when they see successful people, when they see powerful people, they say, oh, we wish we were like them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Fir'aun and Haman who were very powerful at that time. And some of the people with Nabi Musa, they saw Fir'aun and Haman and they said, look how powerful they are. We wish we were like them. Allah gave them a lot. And Nabi Musa said, no, that is not true success. That is not true success. I'm sorry, my dear brothers and sisters. We are programmed this way to respect and understand and honor the Jaludis of our time. Unless we correct that, we're going to be following the same path. Astaghfirullah. No, we have to stop and go back to the Quran that the Imam is drawing our attention toward. Rishad Salawat, please. So, what do we see? Your homework today and my homework today is to recite in the 11 ayahs of Surah 23. The first 11 ayahs, 11 verses of Surah number 23. Please, and give the hadiyah and give the gift of this recitation to Imam al Radha tonight, inshallah, on this beautiful Thursday night. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll, we'll be together, and I will remind you again. But the Imam says, Qad aflah al mu'minun. Surely, the Imam recites the Quran. Surely the believers have become successful. They have gotten what they wanted. What did they want? The second ayah, the third ayah, the fourth ayah, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth ayah talks about the qualities of the believers. And the last two ayahs of this passage, the ayat number 10 says, Surely they inherit. Surely the believers they receive. Surely the believers they get because they worked hard in this dunya. They did not follow the jaludis of their time. They were smart and successful and followed the prophets who were few and became the followers of the imam who were few and who were oppressed. And they supported the oppressed. Right? What did they receive? What do you receive if you oppose the Jaludis and you become the followers of the Ahl al Bayt and the Imams? Those who will inherit and receive and get Al Firdaus. And they will live in it forever. That the ultimate goal here is not just to go to Jannah. No. It is to go to Firdaus. What is Firdaus? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not say Jannah or Jannat in this description? Because some of the ulama, some of the ulama, Sheikh Marhum al-Qurani, he said that Firdaus is the highest level of Jannah. The highest level of Jannah. So the Mu'minun and the qualities of the Mu'minun mentioned in these 11 ayahs that the Imam is reminding us is the cure for us when we are full 
in a time when it is full of jaludis walking around and doing whatever they feel like and being powerful and attracting people with their wealth and their power and their cruelty and their violence and walking safe on the earth. When these people are in this dunya, go back to these 11 verses of Surah Al-Mu'minun. This is the message of the Imam, my dear brothers and sisters. I will describe for you. I will read for you this. To so the first quality of the mu'min, the first quality of the believer, the first quality of the person. Mu'min means someone who is safe. Someone who is protected. Someone who has aman and iman. Aman and iman. Who has safety and belief. So the first quality of a believer is those who have khushu in their prayers. I don't like to translate. I will give you examples. Say, Maulana, what is khushu in the prayer? What is khushu in the prayer? We speak English. We all speak English. Or Urdu. Or any other language. Khushu in the prayer means a number of different things, my dear brothers and sisters. To have khushu in the prayer is to have importance to the prayer. To have khushu in the prayer is to perform the prayer on time. To have khushu in your salat and your namaz is to do it together whenever you can. Always in jamaat whenever you can. To have khushu in the prayer is to do it so much that your concentration is the concentration of a believer and a mu'min. Everyone has heard the story of Imam Zain al Abidin, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. Recite a salawat, please. The days of Arba'in, Imam Sajjad alayhi salam is being taken from one place to another place. Arba'in is when the Ahlul Bayt, when Imam Sajjad reached back to Karbala with Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. They went back to Karbala. We should tell the story again and again to ourselves and to our children. When they reached back to Karbala, they gave their salam to Imam Hussein on Arba'in. It's a very important day, right? But the same Imam Sajjad who went through watching the massacre of his father and his uncle and his brothers and his family and the children, and he went through being taken as prisoner from Karbala to Kufa to Damascus, and then he came back to Karbala. That same Imam Sajjad, one day in Medina, when he went back in 35 years, he lived back in Medina after Karbala. He was praying as he was praying in his Salat. Someone came running and said, one of your children has fallen into the well. One of your children has fallen into the well. What did the Imam do? What did Imam Sajjad do? He continued his prayer. He continued his salat. He continued to pray. After he continued, completed his prayer, he came back and all the people were very worried because there was a child in the well. And there was water in the well. It's very dangerous for children to fall into the wells because back then they did not have taps. They had these wells. You had to dig the water and take it out. And it was very deep. And sometimes there were snakes and other animals in there. You had to take the water out and clean it and then use it. After his salat, the imam came and he said, this is nothing for me. And he commanded the water and the water brought the child up and the child was taken out. This is a level of yaqeen in salat. This is part of khushu and salat. Of course, for you and I, it is wajib that if we are doing salat, if we are praying and someone's life or property is in danger, we have to break our salat and go and help them. As it's a requirement. You can break your salat only when life or property is in danger. Of course, I'm not asking you to do these things, but I'm just giving you an example of the level of khushu and yaqeen that the imam had reached. It's possible to reach this level. It's possible to reach this level of yaqeen and belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our salat and prayer. This is what the Ahlul Bayt are teaching us. They're giving us the best example. They're giving us the greatest example. They're giving us the highest example. You see? So this is one of the meanings of the 
ayah that the Imam recited for us. So my dear brothers and sisters, do your salat together. Do your salat on time. When you are at home, do your salat at Maghrib time together. Inshallah, in your center, you will pray together. At home, you pray together. It will remove all kinds of afflictions and bring you together, inshallah. Recite a salawat, please. Second, I'm going through the verses as the Imam taught us. Those who avoid the believers are those. The second description of believers, Surah number 23, verse number 3. And your homework is to read the 11 verses tonight and give the hadith and the gift to the 8th Imam. Those believers are those, Muslims are those, that when they see lagu, they turn away from it. When they encounter lagu, they go away from it. When someone brings lagu to them, they turn away from it. What is lagu? What does lagu mean? Right? Again, Arabic. What does lagu mean? Lagu means anything that takes you away from your path of what you're supposed to be doing. Lagu is distraction. Lagu can be something that is vain, something that is useless. Lagu can be something that is Completely the uh, 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 example of an indecent thing or an improper thing that takes you away from life. Imam Rada alayhi salam again in his life, what did he used to do? I just mentioned to you that he used to live in Medina, right? 55 years or 50 plus years, he lived in his holy city of Medina before he was forced to go. What did the Imam do? Did he just sit there? No, he worked. He worked for his family. He had farms. He had business. He had a trade for his family. The Imams were leaders because they were economically independent and they were economically strong. <clears throat> the legacy that they leave for us, my dear brothers and sisters, and I pray for your community, I pray for my community, I pray for all communities that we become economically independent and strong. The Imam taught us that. He says, stay away from lagu. Stay away from anything that when you serve other people, you are under their command. You have to work for them. What is happening today? Many people who raised their voices against the genocide lost their positions and their power. Why? Because they were serving other people. They were not masters of their own destiny and their own economy. Again and again and again, the imams have taught us to do business to be independent. Because the person who does their own business is economically a leader and is independent. You don't have to answer to anyone else. Whatever the business is, you have to be economically strong and independent. Not as a person, as a community. Not as one individual who has a lot of money in business. As a center, as a congregation, as a collective. This is our future. This is our future. Look at other people. They can say whatever they want in this world. They can do oppression against innocent people and no one says anything to them because they are economically strong and independent. That is the nature of the dunya. So stay away from lagu, anything that takes you away from your path. If your path is to call toward justice and adl and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then continue to do that without having, without being forced without giving another an opportunity to take you away from that path. So this is the idea of lagu, staying away from lagu. Rishad Salwat, please. The last thing I will share with you today before we have some musibah and masaib, inshallah, before the time of Maghrib comes for you, is that ayah number four, I haven't finished all the ayahs, the other ayahs are remaining. The other verses are remaining. Those who fulfill their activity, who do the activity of zakat, who fulfill the activity of zakat. So to avoid being the followers of Jaludi, we have to have our prayers, we have to be independent economically, to be strong, and we have to do zakat. Not give zakat, do zakat, perform zakat. You say, Maulana, what is zakat? Zakat in fiqh, zakat in ahkam, 
is not wajib on you and me right now because it's wajib on nine things. We don't have any of those, right? It's wajib on sheep or cow or camel or a certain type of gold or silver. Or if you are a farmer, you have raisins or barley. And those things. Zakat, really, that we don't have any zakat on income in our fiqh. We have khums. So zakat specifically means something. Here, the mufassirin say it is general. Zakat here in this ayah means that you give. You give. What do you give? Well, you give those things that are required to give. And you give those things that you should give. And you don't give those things that is better to give. So three categories of zakat. Those things you have to give. If you have wealth, you have to give khums. If you have savings, you have to give khums. If you have any savings left over from your last year, you have to give khums 20% of that. Just a reminder to you, khums is wajib to give. It's part of zakat. Right? In this ayah, this meaning. Second thing, the things you should give, give sadaqa. Give charity. Every day give charity. Give charity on behalf of the imam. Give charity for the sake of the imam. Give charity for the sake of your marhumin. It will reach them. And you will build your connection with the imam. Right? Things you have to give, things you should give. And things it is better to give. No one can give like the Ahlul Bayt. No one can give like the Ahlul Bayt. And Imam Radha alayhi salam, not once, but more than once, he gave half his wealth for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Half his wealth. Half his wealth. Brothers, if you have $10,000 in the bank right now and someone comes and asks you for a donation for Islam, you're going to give $5,000 away? That's very hard. We don't do that, but that's the actions of the imams. They give half of what they have. Again, the imams are the greatest example. The Ahlul Bayt of the Rasul are the greatest examples for us. Try to follow them. And if you have followed them, then you have become successful like the believers. So to give the charity, to give the charity, and it is not just the wealth, it is your akhlaq, it is the bringing a smile on the face of a believer. It is being concerned and having empathy and love for each other. That's part of the zakat as well. That's part of the charity as well. So those who give their zakat, and what is the result of all this difficulty and all this trial and all opposing the jaludis of your time and becoming like Imam Hussein and becoming like Imam al Rada alayhi salam and following the footsteps of Imam Sajjad and following the footsteps of Sayyidah Zainab is that you reach the ultimate success. Remember, jaludi is not a good example of being successful and powerful in the world and doing whatever you want to do is not a, a good example of success. That is why I began with the story. The true success is that of Imam Rada alayhi salam. Alladina yarithun al firdaus. Those who inherit the Jannah, hum fiha khalidun. You will not. They will live forever. You will not live forever in this world. We will never live forever in this world. Last year in Arba'in, some people were with us. This year in Arba'in, they are gone from this dunya. And who knows until next Arba'in who will remain? Wherever they have gone, they will live there forever. So it is better to make that place a beautiful and, and, and a place that you will enjoy and you will be safe because you sacrifice what you have in the dunya for that next world. A moment is wise and makes the best investments. So this is the best thing. Rishad Salwat, please. We come now to the remembrance and musiba of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam and of Imam Rada alayhi salam. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah Assalamu alayka ya Ibn Rasulillah Alaykum minna jami'an Salamullah abadam ma baqina wa baqiya al-laylu wa al-nahar Assalamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al-Husayn wa ala awlad al-Husayn wa ala ashab al-Husayn Peace be upon Imam Hussein. Peace be upon the grandson of Rasulullah. Peace be upon the brother of Sayyidah Zainab. Peace be upon the grandson of Rasulullah. Peace be upon Hussein, the light of the eyes of Fatima Zahra. Peace be upon all the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. 
my dear brothers and sisters, a time came when Imam al Radha was forced out of his beloved Medina, that he had to leave his Medina and he had to go all the way to Khurasan. In the year 200 Hijra, he had to go. And from there, Imam al Radha was left and he left his blessed Medina. He went to Baqi and gave his salam to his ancestors and to the Imams of the Ahl al Bayt. He went to Medina to the Rasul of Allah and he gave his salam over there. And from there, he must have turned and said, Now that you are taking me to Khurasan, let me request you to stop in Iraq. Let me stop in Najaf and give salam to my ancestor Amir al Mu'mineen. And let me stop in Karbala and give salam to my great grandfather Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al Rada must have gone all the way to Karbala. He must have stopped there and he must have stood there and remembered his ancestor Abba Abdullah al Hussein. He must have shed tears for Hussein. He must have said, Oh Hussein, you that were killed on the plains of Karbala, you were killed hungry and thirsty. You that that you lost your life in the plains of Karbala. All your companions were gone, oh Hussein. Hussein, you had to go and bring the bodies of all the young ones of Banu Hashim. Hussein had to go and answer the call of Ali al Akbar. When Ali al Akbar fell from the horse and he turned toward the Khayma and he said, Assalamu alaikum, ya Abba Abdullah. Peace be upon you my father Hussein Imam Hussein must have rushed there and he must have gone there and he must have said, Oh, my son Ali al Akbar, you are leaving me. How am I going to answer you, Aunt Zainab, when I go back? What am I going to say to Sakina when I go back, oh, Ali al Akbar? They are watching from that Khayma, oh, my son. Imam Hussein must have seen that Ali al Akbar is holding his chest with his hands. He wanted to remove those hands. He wanted to see what is bothering Ali al-Akbar. So he went and removed the hands of Ali al-Akbar and he saw that the spear is in the chest of Ali al-Akbar. Imam Hussein saw that his young son has been killed by the enemies of Islam. Imam al rada must have remembered this point when he was in Karbala and he must have given his salam to his ancestor Imam al Hussein. as -salam. Assalamu alayka ya Abba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya ibn Rasulillah. Wa sayalamu alladhina zalamu ala muhammadin ayye munqalibi yanqalibu. Mata min Hussain, inshallah. Ya Hussein, 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 Ya Hussein